there's lots of well-meaning advice for houseplants out there that can actually get your plants into a spot above her. Most of it is harmless and usually a case of just being a waste of time, but some of it can actually make your plants unhappy. So let's not waste any more time and get straight to pulling back the curtain and separating the fact from the fiction when it comes to houseplants. That was quite dramatic, quite pleased with that. And this video is brought to you by Squarespace, but more on that in a little bit. There's a common myth that houseplants should be grouped together in order to thrive. This is normally done to increase the all too important humidity for each of the plants in the group. The idea being that grouping a large collection of plants, like a huddle of penguins in the Antarctic, creates a localised humidity zone, protecting them from the harsh dry air. This is actually not true, and in fact, grouping houseplants together can be harmful to them. When plants are grouped together, it's much easier for pests and disease to spread. Pests love nothing more than jumping from ship to ship, starting little colonies all over the place. This is particularly true when the leaves are touching each other, making it easy for pests to hop from one plant to the next. And group plants can also restrict air circulation. This can lead to problems such as mold and mildew, particularly if your house is already pretty humid. It really doesn't take much for mold to spread like wildfire. If one plant in a group becomes sick, it can easily spread the disease to the other plants. And it also leads to greater competition for sunlight. Plants need sunlight to photosynthesize, of course, so grouping them together can reduce the amount of sunlight each plant receives. I know this is tricky when you have a burgeoning collection of plants and you're running out of room to put them, but just try to have some space between each one. Beginner plant parents tend to get the purpose of fertilizer mixed up. They tend to assume that giving their plants some food is like giving Popeye a tin of spinach. But unlike Popeye, plants don't get super powered after eating fertilizer. Don't get me wrong, fertilizer is great for your plants and something you should be given on a regular basis, but the idea that fertilizer massively speeds up growth is not really correct. Not directly anyway. Plant food contains three macronutrients, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Nitrogen is the one that folks think will speed up growth because it's responsible for helping the plant produce chlorophyll, which is the green pigment that plants use to capture sunlight. But here's the important thing. Nitrogen doesn't make the plant produce extra chlorophyll than it would otherwise produce. It gives the plant the resources it needs to produce the chlorophyll it needs to. It's not going to make them grow twice as big within only a couple of months. The only thing that improves the rate of growth is having it in good natural light. In fact, without enough natural light, even the best fertilizer in the world won't be able to help your plants grow. So, fertilizer should not be seen as a replacement for natural light, but rather an additive to help them on their way. Spotting a yellow leaf on a beloved plant can be a traumatic experience. We're often told to prune away damaged or dying leaves without delay. You may rush over and prune it off without any hesitation to keep alive the illusion that you have perfect plants. I think we've all done this at some point, right? Just me? For me, I'm now learning that there's no rush to prune away yellowing leaves. In lots of cases, it's better to leave them be and see if the problem spreads. Chances are it's just a natural part of aging and will only affect the oldest leaf. As plants age, their leaves will eventually yellow and fall off, and this is a natural process, is not a sign of a problem. And some plants will also naturally lose leaves during the autumn or winter. This is a way for the plant to conserve energy during the colder months. Think alocasia. Sometimes though, there might be a problem and before we cut out the damage, it's a good idea to identify what the problem is so that we can correct it. I like to leave blemished leaves on the plant for a little while to understand if it's a persistent problem I need to investigate further. Is the plant getting enough water or too much water? A spreading of yellowing leaves can indicate this. Is the plant getting the nutrients it needs? Yellowing leaves can be caused by a lack of fertilizer or by poor soil quality, and will start to affect a few leaves at a time. If a plant is infested with pests or disease, its leaves may start to yellow. This is a serious problem that should be addressed immediately. 
So if you spot a yellow leaf on your house plant, don't panic. Leave it on the plant and see what happens next. Most of the time, it's a natural part of aging that doesn't require any attention. You don't want to waste time repotting a plant that doesn't need it. Lately, I've been having a blast putting together my own website packed with juicy details about my channel. And because I'm a noob when it comes to websites, I teamed up with Squarespace today's video sponsor to make it all happen. And Squarespace is a dream to work with. Believe it or not, I had my website up and running in under one hour. They offer a ton of templates to choose from, and the best part is you can easily customize them to give your site a personal touch. Their drag and drop system is so simple, there's no sweat or stress involved. Dragging and dropping images and logos onto my website was a piece of cake. So head over to squarespace.com for a free two week trial. And when you're ready to launch your very own website, visit squarespace.com forward slash Sheffield and use code Sheffield at checkout for a 10% discount on your first purchase of a website or a domain. I've got to admit that I'm guilty of telling the viewers of my channel this next one in the past. I've often said that we should only fertilize our plants during spring and summer and to not bother during the autumn and winter but this might not always be the case. The idea is that plants slow their growth during the winter due to the shorter days and longer nights and so won't need nutrients to help them grow. I realize now though that this advice only works if you live in a similar climate to me or don't have plants under grow lights. If you're lucky enough to have consistent light and temperature year round, then yes, you should be fertilizing your plants all year. They'll be growing, so we'll need the nutrients. If you have plants under grow lights during the winter, then they will obviously be growing too, so we'll benefit from a feed every month at least. I've got a few grow lights dotted around my house, and I've been guilty of not feeding the plants under them during the winter, but not this year. I'm going to continue feeding them and they should be much happier. This next common plant tip is one I've absolutely never followed in all my years of looking after plants and I've not seen any problems with them. The tip, you've got to water your plant first before giving it fertilizer. I've heard this one countless times that I've never really understood why. It's not going to be harmful to do this of course, but it will be time consuming, especially if you've got lots of plants like I do. It apparently keeps the fertilizer from burning the roots and the moist soil helps the fertilizer absorb better. But I'm not really buying that though. There's no scientific evidence to support the claim that watering the plant first will prevent fertilizer root burn. In fact, if you're using a fertilizer that is diluted correctly, you should not have to worry about fertilizer burn at all. And there's also no scientific evidence to support the other claim that watering the plant first will help the fertilizer to absorb better. In fact, the opposite may be true. When you water your plant first, you're essentially diluting the fertilizer, which can make it harder for the plant to absorb. So don't worry about watering your plant before feeding it, just get straight to feeding. There's lots of debate about the use of peat moss in our soil mixes for plants, and whether it's sustainable or not. The truth is, even if peat is sustainable, you shouldn't really use it for your house plants because of its tendency to become hydrophobic. When peat moss becomes hydrophobic, it means that it no longer absorbs water as well as it used to. It almost repels it, it can take a lot of work to get it hydrated again. This can be a problem for house plants because, you know, they need moist soil to survive. When peat moss dries out, the fibers in the moss can become tightly packed together which makes it difficult for water to penetrate. Water kind of skids off the surface instead. Let me know in the comments if you've noticed this yourself. The only real way to hydrate it again is to fully submerge the root ball in water for a good 30 minutes to give the water time to penetrate the fibers. Compost or coconut coir are less likely to become so hydrophobic so readily and are better options than peat moss in my opinion. When repotting a bunch of houseplants, it can be tempting to reuse the same soil again and again. And this is a plant tip I hear lots and lots. This is something I used to do, but have since stopped for a couple of reasons. Let me know if this sounds familiar. You grab some plants that need repotting, you break away the old soil and then put it back into the soil mix container for later use. I mean, it's pretty thrifty, right? I was doing this because I didn't want to continue spending so much money on soil. The problem is though, that this just increases the risk of spreading pests and disease among your entire plant collection. You just never know what creatures or fungal matter are lurking in the soil of your plant. This is exactly how fungus gnats can take over your home. When it comes to repotting, 
I think it's better to just cut ties with the old soil, discard it and stick to using fresh stuff on our plants. It's not worth taking the risk for the sake of saving a few pennies. If you're a bottom waterer like me, then you'll be no stranger to the sight of roots sprawling out of the bottom of the pot. Most of the advice out there suggests that if you're seeing roots coming out of the drainage holes, then it's time for a repot. The roots are clearly desperately searching for somewhere to go, right? Not really. Most of the time, it just means the roots are intrepidly exploring outside of the pot, searching for water. It's perfectly natural and there's absolutely no need to panic when you see this. It doesn't necessarily mean that the plant is root bound. We tend to get a bit too quick to repot our plants when really there's just no need to. A root bound plant is one where the majority of the pot is made up of roots with very little soil. A few roots poking out of the bottom is not a problem. And when it does come to repot your plant and there's a good chunk of roots outside the pot, that there's really no harm cutting these off either. It won't hurt the plant at all. One of the most popular preventative measures for pest control on plants is using a diluted solution of dish soap and water. This is very popular because it's so cheap, seems to work pretty well and is readily available. The problem is though, that not only is it doing a great job of killing the pest, it's also doing a great job of slowly killing the plant. To understand why and what you should use instead, you really need to watch this video here. And if you're a fan of the channel, why not check out my Patreon page linked down below for access to bonus videos and exclusive planty chat server.